It was you telling me and affirming that you can do this. Like mm -hmm. it, you, you went into this business to create something that works for you. So if you're not creating yeah. something that works for you, what's the point? Which was so like, I, I almost needed permission for someone to say, you can take your summers to be as flexible as you wanted them to be. That's Lindsay Bednar, and this is the Powerful Ladies Podcast. Hey guys, I'm Cara Duffy, a business coach and entrepreneur on a mission to help you live your most extraordinary life by showing you that anything is possible. People who have mastered freedom, ease, and success, who are living their best and most ridiculous lives, and who are making an impact are often people you've never heard of until now. If you guys have been listening for a while, you know that I love books, that I believe anything is possible and available to us if you go and get it, and how important I think the power of storytelling is. Today's guest, Lindsay Bednar, shares those values. She is the founder of Rodney K Press, an independent publishing house. She's a writer, an author's coach, a wife, mom, sister, and daughter, and she is diligently in pursuit of her best self and how accessing that best self allows her to be more available, more successful, and more of service to help make other people's dreams come true. All my drinks. I'm like that meme where they're like, do you have six drinks on your desk? If yes, yeah. you work from home. <laughs> yep. Tea, water, coffee's done. Mm -hmm. I'm back on coffee. Shouldn't be, but I am. You know, if you're going to have a vice, I don't know if that's the worst one to have. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Well, I'm really excited to have you here today. Um, I have so many questions because from the outside looking in, your life looks amazing. Oh. You Sweet. have the most adorable, healthy family. You guys do all these fun things. You have a great business that you are kicking ass in. You are active and traveling. And I'm like, that's the life. Like you've got a lot of things nailed. So I'm excited to talk to you about that today. But also you have been a client of mine and you have created this beautiful, amazing way to serve your favorite people who are writers. Yeah. Well, it's... Tell everyone your name, where you are in the world, and what you're up to. For sure. Well, first of all, thank you for that super kind intro. Uh, my name is Lindsay Bednar. I am in Andover, Minnesota, and I am currently uh, publishing, um, started my own publishing company, Rodney K. Press, in 2016, and I've been doing that full-time for the last two years now. And what were you doing before that? I was teaching high school English for 12 years, and that was awesome. I loved my students. I loved the connections I made on a daily basis, but what was missing was that creative outlet. Mm -hmm. And we usually don't leave a career or anything for that matter unless there's something missing. That was my missing. So mm -hmm. it came to a time when, you know, for, for a while, it was just this desire to have more of a creative outlet. Pretty soon it became like a need, like I need to do this or I'm just going to burst. So, um, yeah, so I, I started the company in 2020 when we all had time to pause and reflect and think about what we really wanted to do. That's really when I made that decision to step into a full time. Well, I would just love to go back to eight year old you. When you were eight, what was your life like? What did you see your future looking like? Eight-year-old me. Uh, it's funny that you picked out that age because um, that was like a kind of a, a pivotal point when I worked with my meditation coach and now dear friend Vanessa Files. We pulled out as eight as kind of like something pivotal for me. But when I was a kid, I was super into writing, um, mm -hmm. always wanted to write. And I always had this feeling that I came... I came with a, a, a mission and I didn't know what that was. Um, we have a lot of women who are teachers in our family. That's what my mom went to school for, English teacher as well. My grandma and her two sisters both went to college and were teachers, which 
it's pretty impressive for for that day and age. And so Mm -hmm. teaching was always in my blood and it was something that I, I, it it didn't come as a surprise to me when I ultimately chose that as a career. Uh, But it, it also wasn't something that ever felt a hundred percent right. You know, I, I'm somebody who is very, I don't, my friends and my family make fun of me that I'm like type B and I'm, I'm very <laughs> flexible, very creative. I, I'm very big picture and, mm-hmm. and circular and not linear. Like most teachers I think are, they're super yeah. organized, super, you know, that they, they thrive in that kind of environment. Um, I have a team to help me do that because that's not my forte. Um, and so yeah, as a kid, I was, I'd say, very creative, uh, curious, always wanting to make people laugh. That's been a big part of me, I guess, since mm-hmm. I was young. Um, and, and when you, so you thought you'd be a teacher, it was in your family. And did you imagine like just days like in a room, just writing, surrounded by books all day? Like what was like the fantasy life at that time? Uh, Honestly, I think I saw myself on stages. <laughs> like <laughs> there was a, there was a time where I thought I want to be a musician or I want to be mm-hmm. some sort of artist and I I never knew where my life would take me. I just felt like there was something just big inside of me that I knew needed an outlet at some point. And mm-hmm. so when I went into teaching and when I started my career path it was really more about I have to start adulting now, right? Like, I don't, I don't know exactly what I'm doing, but I know I love interacting with kids. I know I love talking about books and and papers Mm -hmm. and writing. And so that was just kind of a natural transition. But then, you know, they say like your, your twenties, you're, you're just trying to figure it out, become an adult, your thirties, you start to say, what is it that I really want to do? And Mm -hmm. then forties, you tend to apply it is what I've seen. Yeah. Yeah. And how did like you grew up in nearby where you're living now? So I grew up in Northern Minnesota. It's two and a half hours from here, smaller mm-hmm. town for sure. Community where everybody yeah. knows everybody. And I love that as a kid, it is yeah. a fantastic place to raise a family. I would say most of my friends from high school have moved back home because it is such a magical place to grow mm-hmm. up. Um, and Gary, my husband and I talked about it initially, but we also loved the draw to Minneapolis, St. Paul. We love going to concerts. We love, mm-hmm. we have Timberwolves seasons tickets. We love going to sporting events and having those outlets was important to us. Mm-hmm. And now that we have kids, we do that not quite as much, but uh, still fun on an adult date night to go out. And mm-hmm. um, but Grand Rapids, I get up there as often as possible, a lot in the summertime. It's a gorgeous place. Yeah, I've seen lots of pictures or videos of Kristen jumping in the lake. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's a big tradition. We go in the sauna, we jump in the lake. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it's really interesting that I tend to find entrepreneurs in families and clusters. Um, your sister's an entrepreneur. She also wasn't always. Um, your dad ran his own business. Yeah. How, how has seen that other people can create their own income stream and business. How has it influenced your choice to make the leap from teaching to owning a a publishing house? It's a great question. And I I don't think I've ever thought about it consciously. Like it wasn't conversations that I necessarily had with my parents where they pushed us into a particular direction, Mm -hmm. but for sure the modeling was there. And I think the biggest thing is that our parents always made us feel like we could do anything that we wanted Mm -hmm. and instilled that confidence into us. And so even if I didn't feel it at the time or know it, you know, I think that that being raised by people who believe in you is so Mm -hmm. huge. And I think that her and I both come from that. Um, Yeah. We have several entrepreneurs in the family. My grandfather also had a business. And so it's, it's definitely in our blood for sure too. Yeah. Um, how has taking the leap from, from a very stable, steady career as teacher to entrepreneur, how has that changed the conversations that you and Gary have, or the conversations that you even have with your kids about what's possible? 
I could talk about this all day. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, when I first talked to him about wanting to leave the security and structure of a teaching position, it was scary for him, for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, he and I grew up very differently. And I had a very uh, abundant mindset when it comes to financials or, or or just being taken care of where his background led to a more scarcity mindset. Mm -hmm. And so in any relationship, it's super important to have those conversations as, as to how does that affect the decisions you make in your yeah. career and your spending. And so we started to have more of those conversations. But um, when I first left teaching to write my own book and start my company, I was still pretty green and I hadn't fully grown into myself yet. And so I did that for a year and I wasn't earning a, a stable income where I felt like this is, this is viable right now. Mm -hmm. So we talked about it and, uh, you know, we had one, let's see, we had one, we had Whitney and I think Garrison wasn't born yet. Um, no, he was little. He was, yep. So he was, he was little, we had both kids, but it was, yeah, where those financial decisions of, is this something we can do right now? Mm -hmm. So I went back to teaching, I, I went to a new school. And one of the things that was huge in this time period is that I had a mentor who really saw me and believed in me. And she helped to raise my confidence like I had never had in my career before. And that yeah. was huge. And yeah. I, you know, she she would often say, like, I see you growing into my position as as the administrator role. And it was it was ironic because it was all of that validation that allowed me to leave that position, knowing that I, yeah. I am capable of doing a lot. Um, and then at the same time, I was starting to do uh, more of a meditation practice with mm -hmm. Vanessa. And so just being more in touch with myself and what it was that I really wanted to do made that shift. So when I started to evolve as a person, grow confidence and bring on more clients. Um, Gary started to, you know, kind of see, okay, this, this is going somewhere. You could have, could have some more faith in the process. Um, but what really shifted my business was without a doubt, hiring you and taking Thank it. You. From, <laughs> well, it's true. I, I, I took it from something that I was dabbling into being able to step into it full time. And I tell people this all the time. Uh, the it's, it's so funny, the fears that we have about stepping into something that is so divinely us, um, thinking that a teaching job was going to be more lucrative, uh, which if anybody knows teaching salaries and you can look them up online, mine were, you know, mm -hmm. I, I taught in the lowest paying districts probably mm -hmm. across Minnesota. So the fact that I was fearful of that, just um, is surprising to me now. But in addition to that, you know, when I hired you, uh, the very next day, you helped me rearrange my my fees and, and just like the nuts and bolts of my business. The next day, I got a new client, which almost paid for uh, hiring you in full. And it was like, the universe was saying, this is what you're supposed to do. You yeah. made the right move. And now you can relax and really focus on growing this business. So all of those steps combined allowed him to get more on board for me to see it as a viable business. Mm -hmm. for sure. You still hold the record for fastest return on investment of all of my clients and I tell people that now and they're like oh well okay so how fast they they, they get competitive they're like can I do it in less than 48 hours I'm like probably <laughs> I know I actually heard uh Chris on an interview talking about how she made it back in like two days and I was like mm, well I was one so yeah <laughs> Exactly. Um, well, I don't want to step over your meditation practice because I think that's a piece that is so critical to your journey. What does that look like? How often are you doing it? Yeah. What do you use your meditation time for? Like, what, what are you putting into it and what are you getting out of it? Great question. 
Well, I've, I've done a number of things from, I, I had an um, initial session with Vanessa where we, uh, she guides you through really tapping into that inner child and kind of going mm -hmm. inward. And we removed a lot of distortions that I had. So uh, one of the ways in which she explained it a long time ago, and I think it's a fantastic analogy, is we're all born perfect, right? We're just these innocent babies. There's nothing wrong with us. As we grow older and enter into society, we get all of these opinions and labels and things put on to us. And you can think of it like a little splatter of mud. Mm -hmm. So when I was growing up, I was an overweight kid. I was 100 and I think the scale tipped off at 196 pounds when I was 15. And Which I cannot imagine. <laughs> yeah, it was, um, it was extremely humbling. It was difficult in a lot of situations, but I also had a lot of fantastic friends who were, you know, yeah. who loved me for me. Mm -hmm. um, so it wasn't a terrible childhood by any means, but um, I definitely heard insults about my weight, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, every time there was an insult, there's a little mud splattered here. Um, uh, you know, I didn't get into the high math group in sixth grade, little more mud. I'm mm -hmm. not good at math. And so you start to get this story that you develop by things that are outside of you. And it really clouds everything that you have within you and all the potential that you have. So she will go in and start to remove those mm -hmm. distortions, to start to take off the mud and let you get back to who you are created to be with mm -hmm. all your potential. I would say that was the first step. And that really started to unlock a lot of things. Um, I downloaded the Calm app. Every day when I would drive to school, I would get in my classroom, I would shut the door and I would just do 10 minutes of meditating followed by some writing. And that really allowed me just to connect back to self from, you know, sometimes you have a busy morning, especially with a family, you might have the kids arguing or you and your husband getting a tiff and it just kind of allows you to recenter and, uh, and, and breathe deeply. And then, um, I went through her activate course, which was really important for building my business as well, because mm -hmm. do a lot of inner child work to further remove distortions. Um, one of the, when I was, when you had mentioned eight years old, eight year old Lindsay, one of the exercises we did really worked to remove the distortion that I can't do math, which was set in when I was eight years old, when I had a, like a math tutor. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I started working with her, I just thought, oh, my sister's never had that. Like I must suck at math. Mm -hmm. And so it's a story I've told myself over and over again. And so removing those distortions, learning to better connect with your higher self um, has been so important for me, not just to best figure out what it is that I want to do, but also to get the confidence back mm -hmm. that we all inherently have without yeah. all of those labels society puts on us. I love this conversation. I, I think this is so important to release people from all the things that are carrying that have nothing to do with them mm -hmm. and to move everyone back in alignment with how they could be contributing to the world in a right. way that like lights them up and like things start working. So how has stepping into your business, like what has it op opened up or unlocked for you in other areas that have surprised you? Great question and very timely. So <laughs> one of the things I realized with publishing is it the, the things that I love most about publishing are working one-on-one -on -one with clients and hearing their stories. Um, so if it's a children's book writer, it's just getting to connect with them on a personal level and find out mm -hmm. more about them. Uh, I've worked with several authors on their memoirs. So really getting deep into their life and how that has shaped their perspective and the way that they view the world because of that mm -hmm. lens that they have. That was also my favorite part of teaching was outside of the classroom. It was on my prep hour when students would walk in and they would mm -hmm. unload all of this stuff that they were dealing with. Yeah. And I would listen to their stories and think like, 
my gosh, you're so resilient. And if it were me, I wouldn't even be in school right now. Like I, mm-hmm. I'm, I am astounded by the human spirit and, and, and people's unique stories. And so I've recently um, started recording a, my podcast, which we'll be releasing soon, um, called Storytelling. And mm-hmm. my intention with that is to really bring forward my favorite things about everything I've done in both careers, which is sharing those stories that help give people an understanding of why people operate the way that they do Mm -hmm. in this world, you know, what their perspective is, all the different lenses we have. And my intention is when we can better understand the perspective somebody has in their life experiences, we can better appreciate the decisions they're making and how they lead their life. And hopefully dissolve so much of the divisiveness Mm -hmm. in this culture because it's maddening this divisiveness i'm uh, yes we're and like we're for everyone who's listening we're recording this the day after election day in 2022 so it's very present um but i actually got very hopeful looking at how the results were coming in because you saw how um the increase in people voting, like split splitting cards, it's called, where people were choosing to vote independent, Democrat, or Republican based on each person, not just like circling one thing on the ballot, which I was really excited to see because I don't know anyone who is like, I'm over here and there's no way I'm changing. And you're like, no, right. everyone is like, you know, if we had to draw it out, it would be this crazy diagram of like, I agree over here, but I agree over here yeah. and I agree over here. And I'm like, when, when is our, when are our political leaders going to get that we are so much more alike than you are trying to use marketing to say otherwise? A million percent. And we're so over it. Like, yep. nobody actually wants to be fighting with each other. Like, it is this created concept that we're hating each other and disagreeing. And mm-hmm. I, I just... I agree. And with it's the so party system, I, I just don't know, like mm-hmm. the, the vast majority of people I know are also independent because they, they, mm-hmm. they can flex some issues from over here, over here. But even if there's a candidate that rises up, then the, the two sides tend to squash the yeah. person together, you know? So uh, I think we are, i I wholeheartedly believe that consciousness is rising. That yeah. is, Ishy as it is right now, it is because all this stuff has to be unearthed before we can get to where we're going. Mm-hmm. And I I think it's shining a light on how much we all loathe this division. Mm-hmm. And that and that we can start to find common ground. And so that yeah. that gives me hope. Yeah. And and I I love that you've started a podcast. Welcome. Welcome to the community. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and you know. So telling, getting to share other people's stories and just the, I get caught off guard when I meet people who aren't curious about other humans. Yes. Right. Me too. I I recently had an experience where it was such a one-sided conversation. I'd ask a question that wasn't supposed to be a one word, yes or no answer. And that's all I would get back. And I was like, what? Like, are you from another planet? Like, I don't know. This is supposed to like be interactive. Like what's happening? Um, I cannot meet someone and not have a million questions. So when mm-hmm. someone else doesn't, I'm like, what do you think about all day? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> what, what are you using that brain for? Right. Um, I agree. So, so I'm really excited to see the evolution of your podcast. And I love that you're leaning more and more into your talents and your gifts and just like the selfishness of like what brings me joy and lights me up. And I think we get so nervous about being selfish when we're planning not just our business, but our life. Um, And that leads me to something that's also really unique about you as a client. In addition to being the fastest one to get a return on your investment, we also were really strategic in structuring your business cycle to be exactly what you wanted. You mm-hmm. said, I don't want to work summers. I have two kids. I want to spend that time with them. Mm-hmm. And you're like, I don't know how to grow a business and not work summers. Yeah. So what did we do for everyone who yeah. wants to know now? <laughs> yeah. uh, so it was 
basically, well, it was you telling me and affirming that you can do this. Like mm-hmm. it, you, you went into this business to create something that works for you. So if you're not creating yeah. something that works for you, what's the point? Which was so like, I, I almost needed permission for someone to say, you can take your summers to be as flexible as you wanted them to be. Yeah. Um, so that was a breath of fresh air. And what I have learned, books really come in cycles. A lot of people want to release them during the holiday season and they want to release them in the spring, which makes sense. Um, so it it organically lend itself to uh, many of these books would then be in production, which is uh, the other side of it uh, during the summer. And mm-hmm. so whether it was where they were being printed or my design team was working on them, it was more hands-off for me mm-hmm. and just a little bit more management as opposed to really working deeply with content in mm-hmm. those hour meetings um, every other week. And so that alleviated a ton of time this summer. Mm-hmm. And m- my summer looked so much differently from last summer. So I'm so grateful yeah. for that. Well, I'm just glad that you trusted me in it also because so many times a client will ask for what they really want and I'll say you can have it and they go no I can't (laughs) and they choose something different so you were such a great client at just being like okay I can have what I want let's make it and that was really great Mm -hmm. I have to add that in you giving me permission to carve it out just as I wanted to I continued to double my salary from the previous year because of your coaching. So I am so (laughs) great. I love that. Um, And I also want to let everyone listening know that, like kind of talk about what it means to be an independent, independent publisher, because you, you are so much more than a publisher. And there are so many people out there who have an idea for a book, a children's book, their own book, whatever it is. And they don't know where to start. They, they think they have to work with some big, huge company like Penguin or Random House to make it happen. And mm-hmm. you have so many clients who have Amazon bestsellers. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And they've done it completely independently through you because you're not just a publisher. I refer to you as like an author coach. Yes. Uh, so explain to people what the process is to work with you and what would that look like? Yeah. Um, well, thank you for that description, because I, I do also think of myself as an author coach first. Mm-hmm. Uh, the whole reason I got into publishing was because of my love of writing. And it is something that has always inherently come naturally to me. Mm-hmm. And so when I was teaching, it was the same thing. Like I I had teachers that they really loved to analyze books and talk about books. But when it came, came time to writing, especially when the students wrote their memoirs, I was like, yes, this is my favorite project. <laughs> Um, so definitely an author coach first, and I work with authors in their content development from sometimes they have a full manuscript rough draft, and sometimes they come to me with an incredible story and say, I have no idea how to do this, but I have a story to share. And I'm like, Mm -hmm. perfect. You came to the right person. I can't wait to dig in. And I really do love to work with material from the ground up. Because it can be almost more difficult to go back and try to uh, change and and edit something that that is already built out. So um, for anybody who's thinking about writing a book, if if you just have the thought of it, that is a great time to connect Um, because I can really guide from the beginning stages. Um, So in addition to the author coaching, uh, I would say that the first half of our time together is working on the actual content. And we use those meetings to discuss what it is that I want them to build on, uh, what I have questions about. And one of the things that I think anybody will um, say who's worked with me is I will push them to dig deeper. And it's something Mm -hmm. that a a coach, you know, is is always going to do, whether it's your coaching style, a uh, personal trainer, you need that person to kind of push you to the next level. Mm-hmm. And then of course, it's the accountability partner who keeps momentum. So the thing about a creative outlet, especially a book, is it's easy to 
set it aside and you get yeah. busy with all of your time commitments. So we meet every other week so that we can keep momentum and um, they have homework to complete in between. I'll have things I'm working on and then we come together and share ideas. Um, in addition to that, I have learned the publishing industry since I released my first book. So mm -hmm. I know about um, the various ways to bring forward a book, whether it's print on demand, going through mm -hmm. offset printing. Um, I, I understand kind of the Amazon algorithms and, and what mm -hmm. categories books fit in. So um, I also have a, a kick-ass design team that they're fantastic and they're husband and wife, and I just adore them. Um, and we, if, if it's a children's book, I will facilitate the illustrator acquisition because that can be a very lengthy process and very overwhelming to a new mm -hmm. author. And the other thing that I do that I think is really unique and different is I help authors design Kickstarter campaigns. And the reason I do this is because bringing forward a book is an investment. Yeah. Yeah. And it, traditionally, you may not have to, if with a traditional pump, company, you won't have to invest initially, but then they're going to take 75% royalties of your book for its lifetime, even if they're doing nothing to market it. And to me, that's highway robbery. So I don't take <laughs> the royalties. I simply want to be compensated for my time and bringing the book to fruition. And then it's like I send my kids off to college and watch them spread their wings, which is pretty cool. So the Kickstarter, the crowdfunding really does help people offset that initial investment. Yeah, I love that. Well, something that I realized recently talking to another podcast guest, they asked me who my heroes were as a kid. Mm. And I realized that all of mine were fictional. And I didn't realize that until very recently, which just shows how yeah. real they were to me. Right. Like I was obsessed with the Babysitter's Club books as a kid, Nancy Drew, uh, Gem and the Holograms. And I realized that they were all like teenage entrepreneurs. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> it is no surprise that I'm doing what I'm doing now. Right. Yeah. Because as a kid, I'm like, of course you can be 13 and start a business. Like, totally. you're crying out loud. Nancy Drew's like breaking into buildings and that seems to be okay. Like she always <laughs> gets, it, she, it always works out. Um, and I thought that was so crazy to me that of course, there were like powerful other people. Like I always thought it was really interesting, like what Amelia Earhart did. And there were people that were real that I was inspired by, you, you know, parents and family members. But the people who really, I was like, yes, that those are my people. They weren't even real. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How have, like, did you have that same experience with books? Like, do you remember a book that you had an aha moment about either yourself or how the world works or what you wanted? Great question. I would say as a kid, Babysitter's Club was for sure my favorite series. Yeah. Um, and yes, funny that it, that they were kid entrepreneurs, just like acting like adults. Mm -hmm. um, they've come out with a TV show now that my daughter is really into. She's also read all the books too. So um, it's been fun to relive that with her. Yeah. But the book that has shaped a lot of my mindset on how I view the world um, has is the glass castle by Jeanette Walls. Okay. And it's about a dysfunctional family. Um, the dad was like this crazy genius, but a severe addict. And the mom likely had bipolar and was also extremely creative and a phenomenal artist. So, you know, very dynamic characters. And then um, the daughter, Jeanette, you know, throughout the story she had to grow up quickly and become very independent but because of the fact that her her dad was so intelligent and that her, her mom was creative she did and they would do all of these um have these interesting conversations and read big books at a young age she went on to be very successful in life and it it affirmed to me that the only limitations that we have are the ones that we put on ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I've recognized that I come from a very loving family and I have not had a difficult life. So I know that there are people who are like, well, easy for you to say, right? But I've also taught in, in schools and in districts where 
my students had lives not very different from this character. Mm -hmm. And so when we would read this book together and we would talk about it, they, they saw themselves in this woman. And I have watched these kids, so many of them walk away from their backgrounds and make a better <laughs> themselves. <laughs> and so Fozzie says, hi. <laughs> um, so I know that I, I truly believe that the human spirit is incredibly resilient and that we can carve out any life that we want from ourselves mm -hmm. for ourselves. And that if we allow things done to us or, or the past to shape our future, then we're just going to yeah. be kind of spinning our wheels. And so, yeah, that, that book was a huge eye opener for me. And one that I loved working with the students, mm -hmm. um, reading with the students. So that speaks directly into, you know, what does powerful mean to you? And when you see powerful next to ladies, does it change how you're thinking about power? You know, I've, I've never thought of powerful as like a, I guess, a gender specific thing um, until I became older. I mean, I definitely had instances in my career. I remember being called the blonde chick one time uh, in a teaching position by a male. Um, and he was talking to somebody else and referred to me as the blonde chick, right? And so I was like, oh, okay. So that's his frame of reference of what I can bring to the table, apparently, which is very little. Mm -hmm. um, and so I've had situations like that where I wanted, it It made me want to prove to him how valuable I was for sure. Mm -hmm. um, but overall, other than that, I've really just thought of powerful as uh people who refuse to adopt a victim mindset, no matter what's thrown their way, uh, no matter, you know, some of the people I follow on social media are, are, you know, there's one gal who's a CrossFit athlete who doesn't have, uh, she's an uh, amputee, she has one leg mm -hmm. missing. Mm -hmm. And just watching her videos is like, yeah. Man, I, if I don't get to the gym today and she's doing that, like I, I have no excuse, right? So I, I think it's just so inspiring to see people who have all these obstacles and they do it anyways, and they and they work really hard. It's it's inspiring for me. So I would say, um, people who are you know resilient, uh, they don't adopt a victim mentality, and then people who really speak their truth, even when it's mm -hmm. difficult. And do yeah. so in a way with integrity, um, with kindness, and in a way to, you know, really just be transparent and vulnerable. Yeah. We ask everybody on the podcast where they put themselves on the powerful lady scale. If zero is your average everyday human and 10 is the most powerful lady you can imagine, where would you put yourself today and on average? That is a great question. Uh, and one, I think we should all do little check-ins with every so often. I don't, I don't typically think of that. So what I will say is most of my life, I think I was around probably like a three or a four. Um, I, I think I was doing a little bit of hiding. I, I'm somebody who I think a lot of people would have considered the cheerleader on the sidelines as mm -hmm. opposed to stepping out and into myself. And being that person was fantastic because I, mm -hmm. I studied people. Um, I, I I love supporting people, making them feel good. And you get to a certain point where you're like, well, I, I, I want to be out there too, right? <laughs> I literally had, um, it was my sophomore year when you had to be invited to junior prom in order to go. And uh, I watched... Um, most of my friends get asked and I wasn't. And, and that was what propelled me to start losing weight. And I just started walking every day and, um, and, and kind of changing my lifestyle. But uh, I think for a long time, I, I was just scared to step forward. Mm -hmm. And so in the last five years, I think I've really shifted and 
because of my meditation practice, because I've had women who've seen me in a more of a leadership role and I've seen my potential, mm -hmm. uh, I've definitely grown. Uh, I'm, I don't think I could ever give myself the highest grade because I'm a huge perpetual mm -hmm. learner. I'm a big believer mm -hmm. in growth mindset. Mm -hmm. So I'm, you know, maybe a six, seven, I don't know. Yeah. Somewhere around there. For people who consider themselves like not readers, mm -hmm. what do you want them to know about what's possible through books? Mm. Yeah. Well, there's so much that happens when you read a book where you, I don't know how to describe it other than you can be transported to an, another world is, is one thing if, it, if it's fiction or, um, but especially with memoirs and people's stories, um, there's so much that we can learn from, uh, other experiences that we may never have mm -hmm. the opportunity to experience in our own life. And, you know, cultures have burned books to eradicate, a, 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 I mean, societies have burned books to eradicate a culture, right? To, mm -hmm. to just diminish it. And it speaks to how valuable stories are and storytelling is because yeah. it really does give people a better understanding as to um, this, this, lifestyle, this character, this person, mm -hmm. this part of the world. So yeah, I think it's incredibly valuable. I can't imagine life without books. Right? Like, you know, I, you'll often think or be asked, like, if you had to lose one sense, what would it be? And I'm like, not my eyes. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> Please, because I can't like, sure, I could listen to books, but it's not the same. And right. I'm so picky because I do read tangible books and I listen to books, but I'm so picky about who the author is when I listen that I have just stopped after like five minutes been like, nope, I cannot listen to this narrator. Same. Um, but the, you know, everyone in Thrive will tease me or clients because I always have a book for a response often. And I just can't imagine not having it. Like I've, I've had to call back the books in my life um, just from a space perspective and Oh, sure. It's like a whole process of be of really going through that KonMari of like, thank you so much. You're now going to go to another home and make another impact. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, I, there are many books that I've come back to because, you know, it's like my husband and I love comedy movies and we'll recite them a lot of times. And a lot of times you watch something the second, third time and you find like that little line that dry sense of humor that you never noticed before. And it's super funny. Same way yeah. with books, but on mm -hmm. such a more poignant level of things that you pick up on um, that you didn't, that you didn't see the first time or you're in a different part of your life mm -hmm. and it just speaks to you differently. It hits you differently. And so, yeah, there's some I have that I wouldn't give up. Uh, I have the, the glass castle for sure is one. Um, I I love Gabby Bernstein's books um, and and anything that has to do with really uh, the mindset and, mm -hmm. and manifesting exactly what you want, because I really feel like wholeheartedly without a doubt, we are all here with a clear purpose. Mm -hmm. And I think our whole journey in life is to remember what our purpose is. And so we just need to play and like, involves ourselves with the different things that light us up mm -hmm. and eventually things will start to click. Yeah. But I think, you know, the generations that came before us were very structured and, you know, they didn't allow a lot of that play. And I think this mm -hmm. next generation is here to turn the dial on that. And I'm so excited yeah. to see what they do. Yeah. Well, speaking of the next generation, I know family is so important to you. Mm -hmm. How do you, how have you throughout your life prioritized family and how does that continue to evolve as you're stepping into this new phase of your life as well? Uh, yeah. Um, well, for sure. I have, I have been in those moments where I've thought, okay, I created this business for more flexibility and I'm, I'm now like, it's that saying I, I became an entrepreneur so I could quit the nine to five and now I'm working 24 seven. 
um, you can easily fall into that trap when you love what you do because mm-hmm. it's not work. I mean, I find myself a lot of time that in the evenings, if the kids are busy or distracted, just wanting to pull work out and do it because mm-hmm. I enjoy it that much. I didn't, I didn't have that with teaching, you know, you know, you're in your, your groove when you're starting to do that. Um, but there've been several things, you know, uh, you and I working to change my summer calendar so I could be mm-hmm. very present with the kids. Um, I've had my kids uh, verbally say something before. Actually, it was a couple of weeks ago, Garrison said something like, um, you work too much now. And that was a, a bit of a shot to the gut, but I was on my computer and it was in the evening and it dawned on me like I have been taking my computer out more recently. And it's just kind of a slippery slope because sometimes I would take it out when he's going off to hockey, when he's going off to dance, but then I'd be in, involved in something and wouldn't put it away. And so it was a really good check. Uh, mm-hmm. and I have been much more clear on the evenings are so precious and those are my time with the kids um, as well as the weekends and just trying to work as a way as long as they're around and present if they're at activities or you know then I then I can dip back into it but Mm -hmm. um yeah they're to the age where they'll they'll call me on it now which is great and Mm -hmm. um and and I will shift that quickly because that's too Mm -hmm. important Well, for everyone who is excited to reach out to you to work on their book and to help bring their story to life, how can they connect with you, follow you and find you? Yeah. So through my website, there is a book a call button, I think on every page. Mm -hmm. Um, And that will sync with my Google calendar and people can just find a time Mm -hmm. that works for them. Uh, I can be found on Instagram. My handle is lbednar. I do have a Rodney K press Instagram, but honestly, I'm not good at managing both. And because, uh, I'm, I do more on my personal page. That's, that's another one as well. Uh, my storytelling podcast will be up soon. Uh, I have a Facebook page, Lindsay Bednar writes. I'm on LinkedIn as Lindsay Bednar. I think I have a Twitter account, but I I, I don't use it. So those would be the best ways for sure. And, And coming up, we're going to be starting a YouTube channel as well. Love it. And the um, business name is Rodney K. Press. So if they go to rodneykpress.com, they'll find things too, right? Yes. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. <laughs> um, well, it has been such a pleasure to get to spend this morning with you and to so fun. just share who you are with, with everyone who's listening because you, you know, this podcast was almost called The Awesome and the Up to Something. And I really do think that you are awesome and up to something in so many areas of your life where, you know, when we talk about the the eight spheres of life that I'll coach people through, you are intentionally either working on or implemented systems in so many of them. And it just shows that when you, we can't win in all of them at the same moment, right? As your son pointed out, but like, you're so intentional of choosing like what you want and where and what do I need? And is this working for everyone I care about my commitments? And I, it's just such a great example. And yeah. knowing that there are so many stories out there that we need to hear, uh, I'm excited for people to call you so we can get those books made. <laughs> Me too. Thank you so yeah. much. Time just flew by. It, it always does. It's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> to connect with Lindsay and Rodney K. Press are available in the show notes at thepowerfulladies.com. Please subscribe to this podcast wherever you're listening. And I would love it if you would leave us a rating and review. They are so important for show visibility. Come join us on Instagram at Powerful Ladies. And if you're looking to connect directly with me, please visit caraduffy.com or find me on Instagram at Kara underscore Duffy. I'll be back next week with a brand new episode and a new amazing guest. Until then, I hope you're taking on being powerful in your life. Go be awesome and up to something you love.